He is the first of three and the third of three. He has sold to many what they will knowingly never use. He has installed windows through which no one can see. He has offered security where no safety ensues. And now, serving as the on-site services librarian at the Medical Sciences Library of Texas A&M University, Derek Holling is here to tell us where the sidewalk should have been. Well, hello. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Well, my name is Derek Holling. And first, I'd like to thank y'all for this opportunity to come to probably, other than Las Vegas, my favorite city, and uh, also for the opportunity to present on this most esteemed campus. Uh, well, first, I should also express my appreciation and your indulgence for that introduction. Uh, see, my time as a librarian has been somewhat short. I've just entered the profession myself. Uh, and I thought it might be good to, if possible, give you a little insight as to where my experiences have been in the recent uh, history. So with that inspiration of Tolkien's The Hobbit, uh, well, I thought I would word it that way. So to quickly address any curiosity as to answers to that introduction, uh, I'm the first of three which represents I'm the first of three siblings to graduate from Texas A&M University. I'm the third of three because I'm the third generation to do the same. I have sold to many what they will knowingly never use reflects my history uh, selling life insurance. <laughs> uh, the windows I have installed through which no one can see reflects on my time as a systems analyst. And finally, the safety where no security ensues is uh, based on my history as a securities agent selling mutual funds. So, since we've opened the can on funds, Andrea, I'd like to go to the next slide, which deals with the funds of the library budget, the Medical Sciences Library. There's basically three main categories of budgets at our library. The first, and by far the biggest, is the collection development category. The second is salaries and wages, and third, operating costs. Now, there's an unofficial fourth category that we call below the line. <laughs> this below the line category is the recipient of all the savings from all three of the other categories listed. It is from this below the line category that any and all renovations that we do at the library must come from. So the important thing to remember from this slide is there is actually no line item for renovations in our library. It all must come from savings, if at all. Now, some of these below-the-line funds also can be earmarked so that they can carry over to the next year and combine with other below-the-line funds if there is some sort of big purchase that we hope to make. So, uh, also, since there is an irregularity with the amount of funds that go to the below-the-line category, we must make sure that when talking of renovation, especially in the public areas, that we address the needs of the client as best we can. So, Andrea, please. To do that, one of my favorite examples to show is we have to step outside of the library. And when we do that, we see one of the many fields that adorn the Texas A&M campus. And you can see this field is surrounded by trees or some academic buildings on all sides, a bus stop way over to the right you can just see the edge of. To the left, you see the bike racks. In the eyes of the designer, he probably viewed this with a lot of satisfaction. This looks like a nice little area. But at this point, I'd like for us to reflect on a quote by Peter Drucker. Quality in a service or product is not what you put into it. It is what the client or the customer gets out of it. So in the first scene, we saw the view, as I like to call it, the, in the eyes of the designer. But in this scene, from a slightly different angle, we see it from the view of the client or the people who actually be using that area. In this scene, we see how what the designer most likely considered quality and what the needs of the client mandate as quality don't quite match. Here we see how if certain resources are absent, quite possibly the whole intention of the area you had can be destroyed. And in a sense, the client feeling a little bit uh, as if they haven't been attended. Here we see in actual direct feedback 
where the sidewalk should have been. So, in an effort to make sure we're not missing that and we're putting down sidewalks within the walls of our library where we should, the Medical Sciences Library developed what's considered the space group. Now that refers to the space inside the library walls, so the physical space. And the mission of the space group is to address any immediate needs of our clientele as well as anticipate any future and upcoming events. They did this by first doing some scenario planning. In fact, using the identified driving forces of money, which was of course a big one, space and client expectations, they came up with 27 different scenarios of where the library could possibly go. They also combined this with analyzed information based on observation, surveys, suggestions, and user trends, which are trails. And from that, developed possible, probable, and preferred scenarios. Of those 27 scenarios, the one that most identified with where the library currently was and most probable to its immediate future was picked. The scenario was picked and implemented. So now we've talked about the budget and we've talked about how we go about trying to spend the small amount of funding that we have to spend towards renovation. Let's actually look at one of the projects that we did. This is the an old shot from 2002 for the Medical Sciences Library Education Center. At that time, this is our grassy field, we'll call it. At that time, the Education Center was more of a, a computer lab. There were about 30 to 32 machines in there, uh, and consequently 30 to 32 seats, each seat with a desktop computer, and you see the very old monitors there, each of varying sizes. The room was generally used for open access as well as an occasional library class taught whenever we want to teach database searching or something of that nature. Uh, the carpet around there, though it's hard to see from this angle, was frayed and torn going around all the sides. The chairs were in a, actually some serious disrepair. There is a projector and a screen in the room that is backed up. You see the windows there. So you had the windows actually on the back side of the screen, which kind of made a glare issue. There was an instructor table that also had a desktop computer and a machine. Uh, this was identified as a place where we needed to have some change. Also, I would like to point out, we talked about trails. Where are those hidden trails? If we look at this picture, actually, we can kind of see a few right here. We see that there's no space for any books or resources. In fact, it's being laid over keyboards. Many times, to make room for those types of materials, the machines themselves would get moved over to the side, of course, resulting in power loss because a plug would come out or network cable would come out, and it caused a lot of frustration with the clientele. So we want to address all of those things. Okay. In your packet, you should have a list of some of the expenses we had concerning this room. We see up at the very top, 2002, which is where we'll start. I'll give you all just a second to, to get that sheet out. In 2002, we addressed the most immediate need as reported by the clientele and seen by our, by our observations, and that is to replace the chairs in the room. That came out, we put some new customized chairs in the room, which were appreciated, and totaled about $26,000. Now you'll see on 2003, I have a library renovation entered into this, this cell there. What that refers to is, since today we're only talking about renovations as they apply to client spaces, public areas, this library renovation actually refers to a library-wide renovation we had where the entire library, including staff areas, was recarpeted, there was a lot of areas painted. There was a new sprinkler system put in in some places. There was many things that accompanied that renovation. I put it there so that you would understand why there's some blank areas below it. That set us back a little bit. In fact, we even had to get some administrative help from the, from the campus, and that total renovation cost us about $225,000 for all the things that were done. But it did set us back, and so we had to take a few, few years off. So going into 2007, you can see we have new chairs, and we have new carpet, which we did benefit from that renovation. We were approached by the College of Medicine, which is one of our primary client bases, and they wanted us to look into hosting the National Board of Medical Examiners, or the NBME exams, for those of you that know. What that entailed was a certain level of, of computer quality, 
uh, certain applications, certain software, a secure browser had to be installed on the machines. They also required that we have 40 of them, which we currently, or at, before that time, had had 30 to 32 of them. So there had to be some redesign in the room in order to meet this need, which we desperately wanted to meet. Fortunately, about that same time, we were approached by the Instructional, Instructional Technology Services Department on campus, which is responsible for a lot of training. And they wanted a presence on the west side of campus, which is where we're located. And they had money to spend. So through collaborative, collaboratively working with them to give them a presence in order to do their training as part of our educational center services, we were able to get the funding in order to buy enough computers and move around some projectors and screens. And you see a smart board there. They also gave us a smart board and a symposium, which I believe some of you may have seen earlier, which is a little desktop smart board of sorts where you can control the screen from the instructor stand. We also had to reconfigure the room, so we needed some network configuration changes and power changes. So we were able to get some collaboration and get that going. In 2008, we found a few areas where we needed to relocate a few ports, but mostly due to funding, we could only afford to get the room painted. So we have a new coat of paint on the room in 2008. And finally, in 2009, comes the most important, I think the biggest change in the room, we were able to get some new computer tables. And these tables have the benefit of having a back partition where the screens can be attached to this flexible arm and tucked away so if the students want to use it as a flat desk space, they can do that. If they don't, they can bring this arm up and move the monitors to where it's at an adjustable height to where they can see the instructor if they need to, pull it closer, it provides a lot of flexibility for them. Additionally, these tables have casters on the bottom so that they can be rearranged as need be, whether it's for a testing environment and they need a little more seclusion, or if it's for a group study area and they want to push these tables together and create several little spots. So one thing I do want to point out from here, over the seven years, you can see we spent a total, including the funds that were contributed by those other entities, a total of $147,000. One thing my experience as a systems analyst has taught me is if we had been given all this amount all at one time, we easily could have thrown it in that room and made it perhaps a fantastic environment for the first, maybe second year, possibly the third. But soon, due to technology changes, due to new opportunities being made available, uh, we would have had to start putting money back into that room again to keep it consistently relevant. Okay. These are some shots of the after, aftermath. You saw the first shot. This is actually the exact same angle as that first shot was. You can see how we rearranged the, the tables to where they're now facing. There's an instructor station over here we'll get a look at from the instructor's point of view soon. But you can see the wheels on the tables, how they can be moved, how the screens can be tucked away. Here's just a different angle from looking at the other side. And then one more, Andre. And so here's a shot from the instructor's point of view to where you can see the entire room of machines, the symposium right there in the front. There's also something that's really been handy, this little connection up by the symposium where an instructor can come in with their laptop and plug it in and have control of the room just as if they were on our machine. Okay. Thanks, Andrea. So we talked a lot about the education center there. There are a few other renovations that we've been able to afford at the Medical Sciences Library, one of them dealing with current journal stacks. These are our current journal stacks. And of course, over the years, we've seen a pretty steady decline in their usage. Therefore, the decision was made by the space group to relocate the current journals to an area that had in the past been a staff only area and remove these shelves in favor of more user group study areas, which has been a big push in our library. Uh, the cost of moving these stacks was approximately $4,000. And, and what we did was took the old tables from the education center that had been replaced and moved them out into where that current journals area was. And, and the students have really liked it, Andre. This was taken actually just a week ago. And, and uh, it really seems to have a positive effect on the study environment for groups. Now, I should mention, prior to moving the current journals, we made sure and notified in any, every way possible, signage, emails, every way possible that the current journals would be moving. And we did not receive one complaint or concern about moving them. However, after moving the current journals, we received quite a few people who were very interested in having those current journal stacks brought back. Now, 
I stress, it's not the current journals they wanted back. It's the current journal stacks. The reason being that there were a lot of study tables on the other side, and those stacks provided a sort of boundary where they could have some privacy. Uh, as a result, we're right now investigating, I see your booths back here, we're investigating, looking at some booths to put in that area that offer some of that privacy, but more immediately, we were able to take three areas that were staff areas and convert them into new study areas. One of those being a practice presentation study room. And so in this room, along with the others, there was new carpet and new paint. However, specific to this room, we put up the flat panel screen and have a computer there that has all sorts of video editing software on it. There's also a video camera for the room for them to digitally record themselves, play it back, edit it however they need to. The good thing that we're proud of about this room along with the other two is we were able to accomplish creating these as study rooms for under $10,000. One of the big reasons for that is another trail that we had seen from our clients. There had been a trail, we have about 12 study rooms for groups, and half those study rooms had dry erase boards, the other half had chalkboards. And of course, the clients would always go to those rooms with the dry erase boards first, and then the chalkboards only if the others weren't available. It ranges from many things, I think they're more familiar with the dry erase boards, but also there's allergy concerns with the chalk and other things. Well, one of our industri industrious librarians happened through Lowe's one day, and I don't know if they have Lowe's here, but Home Depot, if not, and found some paint that you can paint on the chalkboards that basically convert it into a dry erase board. So for the cost of the supplies and the paint, which was about $120, we saved, next screen, this was actually one of the ones that was painted, we saved a lot of money on what normally would have been about a $600 board give or take a few, also considering installation. And so not only did we have three of these done for those rooms, but we also went ahead and painted the rest of our chalkboards to where in all we saved probably about $5,000 on the whole. A few other changes that we've made is we've tried to start clumping together a lot of our comfy chairs, as they call them. Uh, this particular area we were trying to label the comfort zone. Uh, I'd like to say that as someone said earlier, that they're using those ottomans for sitting, but it seems for our library, they also like to pull them up and just sleep on them. Uh, you'll notice on the, in this little arrangement that there's two little desks there. Those are called lap desks, for lack of a better term, but it's also to encourage people to be able to take their laptops and study by just sitting in those chairs and lay that over their laps where they can have books and so on. Uh, we also have some bean bags that we had thrown around in this area and some upstairs where they could pull it where they want, just to see that's more of a trial basis. On the next screen, please. This screen is representative of a few customer suggestions that we had had. Uh, there were several times that we would have clients coming up to the client services desk and saying that they could not find an empty chair in our library, and this concerned us. And so we would walk around, and sure enough, at least a third of the chairs in our library would be empty. It's just not the chairs that they wanted. So the types of chairs they wanted were not available. So this spurred us to go ahead and get a couple of chairs from some vendors and put them out there and, and start letting our clientele choose what kind of chairs they want. And this is meant specifically in this example for the, the tables in the back there, you see. We want to re replace a lot of those. And so just if any of you are curious, the one, the black chair on the end there won by a landslide. They really liked that one. Um, so next one, please. Okay. <coughs> One last thing I'd like to talk about, and this is still in the works, actually just got approved, and it's going to be started here in the next three or four weeks, is we were able to get approved a glassed-in sound barrier. The way the Medical Sciences Library is designed, we have the first floor that is open for group study, or that seems to be code for its noise is okay, and then we have the second floor, which is meant as a quiet area. However, there is a huge open atrium right above the client services desk between the two floors. So phones ring, people are talking, the sound flows right over this atrium wall and, and throughout the quiet floor. And there's numerous people that'll come down and say, can y'all keep it down a little bit? It's a little too loud. And so what this will do is a glass sound barrier is gonna put, be put on the outside of the atrium on the second floor, which not only will block the sound from flowing up and over, but also create a sort of noise area that can be allowed on the second floor in case they need to run through real quick with the cell phone call that we always seem to see. So we're really proud and excited about that. 
The last thing I would say is it seems like as librarians, we're constantly anticipating what the future will bring with respect to client needs. But through these renovations, we found that at times it's necessary to take your view off the future field of vision and look instead for those hidden trails and potential sidewalks that otherwise would be missed. So thank you.